morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka. We're glad you're able to join us for this snowy, icy January Sunday to worship the Lord together as we uh, celebrate. Um, I do want to read for you a passage from Scripture, Psalm 75, verse 1, which says this, We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. As we gather together to worship this morning, we want to remember both who God is and what he has done as we celebrate. So let's bow our heads and our hearts together as we pray. Father, I pray that you would give to us your help as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. We know who you are because you've revealed yourself to us in your word. And we trust that your word is true. You breathed it out for us. Now, thousands of years ago, yet you've preserved it for us, that we might read it today, and through the, the power of your Spirit, to see you, and to see what you've done. And most gloriously, that we can see the gospel, and what Jesus Christ has done in our place, that through faith in him this morning, we have great joy to worship you, even when things in our life are not the way that we want them to be. We can trust in the promised provision that Christ has made in our place and the life that we have in him. Help us to worship you together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you please join us in standing together, we'll sing gift to our God and Lord of praise.
morning worship offering, and I want to thank you for being here today, and uh, just, we're going to ask that God bless the offering at this time. God, we are thankful that we can be here and worship you. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to give. Uh, Lord, we know that this church has existed for many, many years, and it's um, because of your grace, it's because of your faithfulness, um, and Lord, how you have used the, the giving of, of people here for a long time. Lord, I just pray that you will bless those that give. Lord, help them to give cheerfully. Lord, I pray that you will give wisdom as we uh, discern how to use the money that your people give. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
verses of scripture. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And I cried to him and reached his ears. Sing to you, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer.
individually to our God and ask him to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word this morning. pray this morning that you would help us to be able to give these things to you, that we might be able to open up your word now as our pastor comes and preaches your word, that you would show to us Jesus and his forgiveness and grace offered to us freely by the work that he did on the cross. And I pray that this morning we would be affected by it, not as people who just see the truth, but as people who are changed by it, who are determined and then empowered by the work of the Spirit to go from this place and to be different based on the encounter that we've had from your word. I pray that you would embolden our pastor as he preaches. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive. I pray that you keep us attentive and alert we didn't get enough sleep last night, I pray that we might have energy to be able to focus, that we might not miss what you have for us in your word today, so that we would be edified, so that you would be glorified by the attention that we give to your word, which is most precious and valuable, and that our worship to you would be clear by the way that we value your word. We pray these things because of Christ and in his name. Amen. If you're able to, would you please join us in singing once more as we sing our final song before the message this morning. Show us Christ.
Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Excellent singing this morning. Genesis chapter 1. It's always hard when, uh, due to weather or whatever circumstance, the attendance is a little down. Uh, it's hard to uh, fill the auditorium with sound, but you guys did an excellent job with that this morning. So, um, it's great. Genesis chapter 1. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, I, I come to you and the, my desire is what we just sang this morning just now, that the preaching of your word is, points to Christ. Or that we understand today, after looking into your word, a little bit more about you, which helps us to see a little bit more about our condition, and helps us to understand even more the grace and mercy given to us through Christ. Lord, I pray that you will guide me as I preach. Lord, help me to get out of the way and help your word to do the work. We ask that you are glorified, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Genesis chapter 1 is where we will be this morning. Today um, is, as you see on the screen there, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. On January 13th, 1984, President Ronald Reagan issued a presidential proclamation declaring the 22nd of January uh, of that year, 1984, as National Sanctity of Life Day. As he made that proclamation, he, he noted that it was the 11-year anniversary of the, of, of the court decision, Roe v. Wade, where the Supreme Court issued a ruling that guaranteed women access to abortion. Now, President Reagan was a strong anti-abortion advocate, and, and he said this one time, that Roe v. Wade uh, struck down our laws to protect the unborn children. Now, the view of human life uh, to, continues to this day to be under attack, not just in the area of abortion, but in, in so many other areas where human life is under attack. So how should we view human life? Um, I don't know about you, one of my favorite authors is Dr. Seuss. How many of you would agree with that? Dr. Seuss is a great author. Uh, he has a book, and, 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 uh, which was made into a movie, that when my kids were younger, we used to watch often, and it was Horton Hears a Who. How many of you uh, have watched that movie or read the book? If you haven't, you should do it. Even if you're an adult, it's, it's funny. Uh, but Horton Hears a Who is a story about an a elephant, that has incredible hearing, like all elephants apparently do. I don't know if that's true or not, but Horton did. And Horton heard, there was, and he had a, found a tiny little ball of dust, and on it he heard a voice. And we discover in the story that that voice belongs to an individual in the town of Whoville, and a people, a, a huge area of Whoville people, and they were under a uh, great problem because this tiny little speck of dust was in danger of being destroyed, which would destroy all the Who's. And so Horton decides that he is going to protect these Who's. And so he says, I'm going to take this little speck of dust and I'm going to carry it to a safe place. Well, all the people around Horton think Horton has lost his mind. They think he's crazy, especially in the story there is this uh, this, this mama kangaroo that says he's crazy, and she hires individuals not only to stop Horton, but to, to destroy that little speck of dust. And Horton is trying to convince everyone that he is right, and he says this, Even though you can't see them or hear them at all, a person is a person no matter how small. Now it's interesting, that phrase from Dr. Seuss's Horton Hears a Who has been taken by many uh, anti-abortion advocates and has been used as kind of a slogan. Uh, a person is a person no matter how small. Now side note, Dr. Seuss's family is suing those people because they said that's not what he intended. Well, we're going to say it's what he intended, whether he did or not. But that little message is true. Yet... Since Roe v. Wade in 1973, 61 million babies have been aborted. But sanctity of life, as I said, goes beyond abortion. 
Sanctity of life addresses uh, issues such as euthanasia or, or uh, embryonic stem cell research or, or even, uh, uh, in some cases, how, how people view uh, race or, or other type things. It it's extends so much beyond in so many different areas. Somehow the idea of sanctity of life, or, or right to life, as you often hear it, uh, has become a political issue, and in many cases it's a very debated topic in our culture today. And I want to be very clear as I go into this message about a few things. First of all, this sermon is not a topical mess is, is not a political, excuse me, message. Uh, it has nothing to do with politics, honestly. Um, I'm not expressing the views of, of any political party. I'm, I'm expressing what the Bible says. Secondly, this message is not about abortion, although abortion is addressed while we answer and we look at the passage that we're going to look at this morning. In this sermon, my desire is to go back and look at how does God view man? How does God view and value man? And see how God does uh, sees man, and in, in, in a sense, from that, we'll answer many of these tough questions, though. Okay, so I'm going to look at three aspects of this uh, passage. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, and I will read for you. You can follow along, starting in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over... The all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When we look at this passage. This passage uh, does a few things. It shows us the value that God places on man. And I want to look at three aspects of that. First of all, God assigned special responsibility to man alone. Let's look at, uh, we see in this passage, especially in verse 26 and verse 28, uh, this passage gives two responsibilities or two commands to man that we need to notice. The first one is, be fruitful and multiply. Now, the idea of being fruitful and multiply was not unique to man in the sense that God told the beasts of the field to be fruitful and multiply as well. If you look in verse 24, it says to, to bring forth and, and, and continue uh, bringing forth living things. And so uh, God's desire, oh, excuse me, verse 22 is where I was looking at, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and the seas and all that. God wanted them to do that as well. But there's a special idea that God is telling us as, as human beings, the responsibility to fill the earth with inhabitants. Um, much of our view of Christian ethics comes from chapter 1 of Genesis. And uh, this past, in 2019, on Sunday night, we studied ethics, and so we talked about this quite a bit. I'm not going to uh, go into all those topics, but uh, many of our uh, Christian ethics are our leanings toward in Christian ethics come from this passage. One of those areas that I want to mention just briefly, and I'm going to talk about it more in a little bit, is this command to fill the earth started with two people, right? Adam and Eve. But it led to the 8 billion people we have here on earth. Um, often a question that people will ask about uh, Adam and Eve is, what race were they? Well, simply, they were the race of human. <laughs> they were the human race. And from that, we have now 8 billion people who are all part of the human race. Now, we have distinctions, we have, uh, we have differences, we have uh, aspects about us that aren't the same, but the, the Bible makes it very clear that there is one race, and that is the human race. We see that because it started with this one couple. So God says, be fruitful and multiply. But the second one, I want to dwell a little bit more. Man was given a responsibility to have dominion over the earth. Now God mentions in verse 26 and verse 28, having dominion over the animal kingdom. Over uh, the birds and the fish and, and the land animals. But in verse 29, I'll read that as well. God uh, extends it even further. Look at verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. God, God is saying this. 
Not only am I giving you the animals to have dominion, but I am also giving you all of creation is under your control. Now, what does he mean by dominion? When he talks about dominion, uh, what is he saying? He's saying that man was to exercise uh, authority over both the earth and all of its all of its inhabitants, all of the living creatures on earth. Um, now, this dominion was to be seen as a um, stewardship, not as a independent human sovereignty. In other words, God gave dominion under his authority. Man was to care for the earth and its creatures. Man was to develop the earth, was to utilize all of the earth's resources and not to spoil or, or deplete them. Uh, God told Adam uh, that his purpose for his family was to be caretakers. In fact, if, we're not going to look there, but if you look in chapter 2, uh, God tells Adam to care for the garden, to tend to the garden, and, and that was responsibility. God was not giving man, in, in this case, Adam, he was not giving them a license for recklessness. The idea of rule and subdue meant to care and organize, to do what was best for the earth. Uh, think of it this way. Um, Let's, let's imagine that I own um, a, a farm. <laughs> uh, makes me laugh because I'm not a farmer. But imagine I owned a farm and I was going to be gone for a period of uh, three years. Okay, And so I, I went to Mark and I said, Mark, I'm going to be gone. And, and so I, I, I would like you to uh, care for my land. I would like you to rule over my land. And Mark's laughing because he's not a farmer either. But uh, I was to say, Mark, this is what you're to do. And, you know, would Mark then say, this is awesome. And he goes to my farm and he, and he hops on uh, the truck that's sitting there and he goes out in the field and he does donuts in the field and tears up the crops. And uh, that's what he does. Or he throws the trash into the... No, he, he knows. What is he saying? That, that what, what he's being asked to do is to, uh, to tend to the crops, to tend to the land. If there's animals, to tend to those, to, to care for them in such a way that they are productive. Uh, they, they, they should cultivate the ground. They should su subdue the weeds and the bugs and all, all the other pests. Have dominion over the earth does not give us license to do uh, what we want, but it, and God entrusts us to care for his creation. Now, it does not mean that we have to turn into some you know, crazy environmentalists that protect the earth at the cost of mankind. God never intended for, for the creation to have rights over man. But we do have a responsibility. You say, why does this matter? This matters because God said something. I am going to set you apart from all other part of creation. And I'm going to set you apart because I want you to know that you have a responsibility that I'm not giving to any other part of creation. Because I see you as something different. Second thing we want to notice is God's creation was done in a unique manner. God gave us a responsibility that he didn't give to any other part of creation. But God's, uh, the way God created man was unique. Uh, look in chapter 2. We're not going to read all of chapter 2, but I want, to, I want to take just a few minutes to look at chapter 2. Um, because chapter 2 points out some things that chapter 1 doesn't. Um, some, some have stated that chapter 2, and if you've, if you've taken the time to read Genesis 1 and 2, you'll note this. Some have stated that Genesis 1 and 2 almost seem like uh, two different stories. Um, that, that there, and, and many people have said there's, there's contradictions between the two. Uh, let me give you some examples of that. If you look in Genesis chapter 1, we see the order of creation. And the very last thing God created, uh, according to Genesis chapter 1, was man. But if you look at Genesis chapter 2, especially in verses 5 and 6, it, it indicates that maybe man came before the, the plants. So is that a contradiction? Another uh, difference is the name of God that's used. In Genesis chapter 1, the name of God is very specific. It is the name Elohim. I'll mention that again in a minute. The name in chapter 2 is the name Jehovah. And that is why there has been some debate over whether these were two different stories, two different creation accounts, maybe two different authors. Let, let me give you an explanation that I think addresses these differences 
uh, that show that they're, they're not contradictions. I believe that the, the reason for the differences is based on the focus of why the chapter was written. Um, chapter 1, if you look, was written in a very academic style, focusing on the chronological uh, events that took place. Chapter 2, however, was written in a more poetic style, and, and, uh, which focused on humanity itself and how humanity was a part of creation. And so because of that, that would explain even the differences in the names. I said before, chapter 1 calls uses the name Elohim about God. Elohim is a, um, is a very formal name of God that expresses his power, uh, his creative act. In chapter 2, it's Jehovah. Jehovah is a more, it's, it's a more personal name of God. Uh, it, it shows still that he is powerful, that he has authority, but yet his authority and his power is done in a way because he wants to connect with those under him. And so you see, even in, in that sense, there's two uh, different uh, uses, but I, I think it's uh, understanding there is, is it's, it's the same events, but seen in different, two different ways. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, imagine if uh, I was to bring up here, I'm not going to do this because it embarrass you. But I was to bring up a couple, a husband and wife up here. Okay, let's say you've been married for uh, 10 years. And I was to bring you up here, and I was to say, okay, I want you to tell me the story of your first date. Okay, and I go, I go to the husband, and I say, okay, what was your first date? And he's like, well, uh, we went to this restaurant, food was good, then we went and walked around a park, and it was cool. It was a cool night. Do you think that's how the wife is going to respond to that question? No. If I was to say to the wife, um, okay, tell me, how did your first date go? Well, let me tell you how it was. It started off this way. He showed up. Oh, he looked so cute. He had on these new pants and this, this button-up shirt. It was green. And oh, it looked just great with his green eyes. It just, I just loved the way it looked. And his hair was done a certain way. And oh, it was so nice. And he picked me up, and we drove to this restaurant. It was a beautiful restaurant, and, and I just loved the food, but the decorations on the table were so pretty, and, and it all matched together, and it was just a really nice restaurant. And afterwards, we walked over to this park, and we walked around, and oh, we held hands, and the, the, the stars were beautiful, and oh, we just looked up in the stars, and do you see the difference? Now, is that accurate? Yes. And I think, uh, and I'm not saying that chapter 1 and chapter 2 are, are two different people, but what I am saying is from two different perspectives of the same event. Chapter 1 is, is academic, chapter 2 is poetic, and we see, and you, you say, why are you saying this? I'm saying all this because I want to show you one other difference that's mentioned in chapter 2 that I think reveals something amazing about how God viewed us. So look at that. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says this, Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living creature. As I said, chapter 2 shows more of the, the, the personal, poetic side. And when we see this, this verse shows us something very unique about how God made us. About how God made us. In Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1, if you look there, it says, In the beginning God created. Now that word created is, is a word that means out of nothing. That God simply spoke and it existed. But in chapter 2, verse 7, when God talks about making man, he uses a different word. Look again what it says. It says, The Lord God formed man. That word is a word that is used oftentimes to describe the work of an artist, uh, the work of a sculptor, the work of a potter. Okay, someone who, who doesn't just, um, it happens quickly. No, someone who, who takes their time, and, you know, makes their creation and then steps back and looks and goes, oh, it's not good enough. And goes back and redoes it. You know what it tells us there? God, God made us with a tremendous amount of care. 
God made man, and it wasn't just something uh, insignificant. No, there's, there's a tremendous amount of care and love and, and, and compassion that goes into it. It describes something that came from something else. Yeah, in this case, it's the dust of the ground. And then it says something interesting. It says that God, if you look at the end of the verse there, and after God formed man, formed Adam from the dust of the ground, then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We don't see that about giraffes or about ants or about fish. We see this about man. Because God had an incredible view of his creation that he made. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's interesting to note that the only other place in scripture that we see God breathing into something is in Timothy when God is, uh, Paul is speaking, but he's telling Timothy about the word of God. And he says this, he says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed. Now, those two uh, elements that talk about God breathed, his word and man. God breathed. God made us in a unique way and he gave us life that is unlike life experienced by any other creature. And that's an unbelievable thought. It also tells us that without God, we would not live. We would not have breath. The name Adam that we see uh, as the first man, his, his name uh, is, is from the Hebrew word that means man. Um, it's interesting that the, the Hebrew word that means dust is, is a, a similar word. That from that dust, God made man. It only happened because he breathed into his nostrils. And so we see God's creation of man was done in a unique manner. But thirdly, and this is what I want to focus on the most today, is God made man to be patterned after his image. Look again at the passage uh, for today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He says there, God is speaking, and we see uh, the, the plural use uh, of God there, um, um, implying the Trinity was involved in verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Uh, this is a question that has been asked for thousands of years. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Usually when this topic is discussed, the, the first thing that is mentioned is God is a spirit, meaning God doesn't have a body. So this made in the image of God is not referring to a, in a physical sense. So it's not that uh, our, God's body looks just like ours. That's not what it's talking about. Now the image of God is usually defined as uh, having a, a sense of right and wrong, a sense of morality, having a will to choose, having the ability, this is a big one, having the ability to relate to God. And all of those things are true. All of those things are right. God, God made us unique in that sense that, you know, uh, animals cannot relate to God. Animals cannot have a relationship with God. Animals do not have the ability to choose right and wrong. Now, they can be taught things, but it's not that they're choosing. They just know, hey, if I... <laughs> If I do this, my owner's going to slap me on the nose, so I'm not going to do this. It's not that they're choosing right and wrong. God has made us unique in that. But I, but I want to look at the image of God in a, in, in a simpler way. We are made to reflect God in a way that no other creation, part of creation has. Uh, John, John Piper put it this way. He said this, that the way that the image of God affects our life the most is to say this, that images were created to do what? Image. Now, it sounds like a weird way to put it, but the idea is there. That God made us as an image, so what is an image supposed to do? If uh, you make a, a, an image it's, or a piece of artwork or, or something else, it is to reflect, it is co to communicate you as the artist. God made us in his image, and we are to reflect him. We are to communicate him. Now, what, if, what, if, uh, uh, what would it mean if you created billions of images of yourself and put them on the world? It would mean you want people to notice you. 
And God created us in His image so that we would reflect or communicate or display how great He is and what He is like. Here's the problem, though. When Adam sinned, when Adam uh, went into the garden and Eve said, Hey, look what Satan gave me, the serpent gave me, and it's good for food. And he took that apple and he ate, and God said that was sin. Suddenly the image of God was marred. No longer was, 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 no longer was Adam reflecting God. I heard one author put it this way. It, imagine if you take a, a, a mirror. This isn't a mirror. But imagine you take a mirror and you put it at a, at a 45 degree angle and the sun shines down and it reflects to all the world around you. That's what God intended for us to do. But what happened is when sin came, the mirrors turned around. Of course, this isn't a mirror, so the other side looks the same. But the mirror is turned around and what happens is no longer do we reflect. And now mankind became this, uh, this creation that was not meeting up to the, what God wanted it to do. And no matter how hard man tried to break that sin pattern, nothing seemed to work. And every man that was born after that. So uh, Adam and Eve had their children and, and Cain and Abel. And we know Cain, what did he do? He killed Abel. And so uh, again, he marred the image of, of God that God had intended. And, and we could go down the line and man after man after man, woman after woman after woman sinned against God. And so because of their sin, that image was marred. And no longer did we reflect and, and display the glory of who God is. Is because of our sin. And no matter what we do, we can't fix that. And God knew that the only way they could fix that was that the sin problem be solved. And so the Bible tells us that God sent His Son. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth. Now here's the amazing thing, is Jesus Christ never ever sinned, which means he never marred the image of God. He came as a human, 100% human, and as a human, he walked on the earth sinless. And everywhere he went, he reflected the image of God to the world around him, and he showed, and, and, and even though he was sinless, he died for our sin, so that our relationship with God can be restored, and so then, again, we can begin the process of, again, trying to reflect and show off the image of God. The problem that sin created is that it covered, it marred, it ignored the image of God. But God chose us to be His image. Because God chose us to be His image, there are three implications that I want to go over in just the next few minutes of what the image of God means. First of all, Every human life, because we're in the image of God, every human life has immense value to God. If all members of the human race come from the act of God creating mankind in his own image, then each individual human being is incredibly valuable. Incredibly valuable. There's a museum in Washington that displays a, a portrait of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. Tsar Nicholas II of Russia uh, was the leader of Russia, and he was killed uh, in the early 1900s. But this, this portrait was made, and it was, it was put in a, in, in a, a location, uh, and, and I think it was in Russia, and um, when his enemies came in, uh, they don't know who, they don't know exactly what happened. They believe it was somewhere around the time of World War I. Someone came in to this portrait and they took a, they took a knife and they sliced it down uh, the middle across his face and across this way. Well, that, that image was then taken, that portrait was then taken, and, and it's since then been sewed back up. But if, if you can search it, there's, a, there's I was going to show it, but I forgot to put it up here. There, there is an image, there is a picture of it where um, it's, it, here he is, here's this guy, Nicholas the Tsar, and he's standing there and he's, uh, he looks all regal and royal and official. He's got this uniform on with all these medals and right down the middle of his face and across his face are slash marks. See, the reality is we don't know who did it, but somewhere along the way, 
Someone entered that room and, and they, they did not like the czar. And so they, they couldn't really do anything to him. So you know what they did and said? They marred his image. They destroyed his image. And here's the thing. Every time one of God's uh, hu- members of God's human race is, is singled out for violence or, or uh, marred in some way, it's, it's just like slashing the image of God. And we look back and we see events in, in our history and in our presence where, where, where times where people were treated poorly and, and the image of God was affected. We think back in a dark period of our country where a certain group of people were, were kidnapped and enslaved merely because of the color of their skin. We think of times when, because of someone's ethnic origin, like uh, the, the uh, Irish and at one period of our country, where because of their ethnic origin they were treated poorly. We think about today, about people who are attacked because of their religious views or their moral decisions. And this, I, I think about, as I was studying this, I think about, um, I think it was in the 90s, there was a young man by the name of uh, Matthew Shepard, maybe some of you remember him. He was a young gay man. And he was beaten brutally. It's not a question of whether his lifestyle was moral. It's a question of, of the immorality of maliciously beating another human being. The reason that it's always wrong is because the life of an individual, no matter how moral or immoral, no matter how agreeable or disagreeable, no matter how right or wrong their lifestyle is, every single individual was made in the image of God. And therefore is incredibly valuable to God. That is why when, when, uh, when Noah and his family got off the ark, God said, hey, I, I got a new uh, a command that I want to give you. And this is the command he said, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. James took it even a step further. Look what he says here. With it, this is talking about our tongue, this whole passage. And he, he says, with it we bless the God and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be. What is he saying? This Not just, not just uh, murder, but also how we use our tongue as we attack other people. What is he saying? We shouldn't do that. Why? Because they were made in the image of God, and so they are incredibly valuable in the eyes of God. Think about that. Think about that when you criticize someone unnecessarily. Think about that when you put down that, uh, that person at work. What is God saying? He says, this shouldn't be so. This person was made in the likeness of God. And so because of that, they have an uh, incredible amount of value. And so therefore, every life, every single human being, no matter how esteemed, no matter how despised, according to earthly standards, has been made in the image of God and therefore is incredibly valuable. Second implication from this made in the image of God is this. Every human life's God-given value is equal. Now, we're accustomed to speaking about different races of people in the human family. If you ever considered what it says in Genesis 1 and 2, and we talked about this earlier, uh, then, then we understand that it's not really accurate to speak of different races of people. The Bible speaks nowhere of different races of people. Instead, what we find in the Bible is one race of human beings that uh, all came from one source. Uh, let me show you a verse that talks about that. In, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is speaking. It says, And he made, uh, it's God, and he made from one man every nation of mankind. From one man. Revelation says it this way. After I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and all people and languages standing before the throne. So here's the, the amazing thing is mankind started from, from one man. And the Bible tells us in, in, in the end, this is talking about the end times, in the end times we will all, all gather again as one. I, I've had the privilege of being in uh, numerous countries. Um, and 
you know, you get over there and you realize you're out of your element, <laughs> wherever it is. Uh, I remember the first time going with uh, Tim and Sandy Fink to Romania and uh, being among the gypsy people whose lifestyle and culture and, and manner of life and, and value system and, and pretty much everything is completely different. But I, what I loved was getting with them in church and realizing, you know what, the truth is, is that when we serve God, we all serve the same God. It doesn't matter that my language is now. You know, it, it frustrated because I wanted to talk to them, but I couldn't. I didn't speak their language. But one day, as it says here, every language will gather. And I will, I will be able to stand next to Pastor Yosef, who pastors the churches that Tim started. I will stand next to Yosef, and we will be able to communicate together. But we will do it for the glory of God. There will be no distinction. There certainly are differences between different people groups around the world. But not in terms of our origin in Adam. And a common origin in Adam means an equally common dignity or value in the eyes of God. As I said, we all have value, but our value is equal. No people group should ever be singled out as being less important or more important. No people group should ever be seen as, as, as being unequal in any way. Because God says we are all equal. Final thing, implication I want you to notice is every human life is treated as sacred from God. If we are made to reflect God, whether man does it or not, has definite implications on how we treat man. Every being that God created was made in his image, and so therefore it should change our ethics and how we treat people. I mean, none of us would disagree that murder is wrong. But as I said, this goes beyond just simple murder. So let's look at a few areas. First of all, we think about, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the area of abortion. The question we have to ask is, did God make babies in his image? The answer is yes. Now whether you define a baby as, uh, as, as a, one that isn't a baby until the moment of birth, or you define it at the moment of conception, uh, it is the problem, right? Because uh, some people will say, yes, I, I agree that, that babies are valuable once they're born. But the Bible says something different. I mean, even look at, look at this. In, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, God was talking about Jeremiah, and this is true of all mankind. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God is, God is putting uh, a, a clear understanding here that even before Jeremiah was in the womb, God placed value on him. Before you were born, I consecrated you. God tells us that he considers a baby to be at the baby at the earliest possible point. Meaning that abortion is, is understanding of abortion is this, is that, that God is saying that we're, we're again devaluing the image of God. So we fight for the unborn. Now there are many ways to do that and many of you here are involved in different ways. Uh, maybe it's how you, how you vote. Maybe it's that you go and you try to find opportunities to talk to those who are considering abortion. Maybe it's you, you financially fund different organizations. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's that you help out at uh, pregnancy centers. Maybe there's many of different ways you can be, but I encourage you to, to fight for the unborn because they are made in the image of God just like you and I. Another area is, is the elderly or the, the uh, physically handicapped or the terminally ill. They are made in the image of God. In many cases in our world today, uh, more so in other parts of, of the world than here, but even here, uh, there's this devaluing of human life because they are not because they have they have issues or they have uh, they they are not contributing to society. Whether it's because they're 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 old or whether it's because uh, they can't physically contribute to society because of a physical problem, and therefore they do not have value. And the Bible says that is not true. They are made in the image of God. Oh, they may have uh, a physical deformity. They may have uh, a mental 
deformity of some kind, but they are still made in the image of God, and so therefore they are to be treasured. We could mention many others, uh, but I don't, I don't want to get too deep into all of those. But I want you to stop and I want you to think about how do we view other people? And I want you to make this even more practical. Do you treat those in your life on a day-to-day basis as, as, as individuals who have been made in God's image? Do you treat your coworkers that way? I think sometimes as Christians we get this um, arrogant view that somehow we're better. That somehow we're, we're superior because we're believers. And the truth is, is that's just not at all the case. Now, it may be that God reached down in his, in his grace, he drew you to himself. And so because of that, you are secure, and you one day will be in the presence of God. But that, no, that does not devalue a person who has not come to Christ. So it's our responsibility as people to, to uh, reflect the image of God, but it's our responsibility also to value uh, the, the creation that God has made and the, uh, the people that God has made for his glory. Let's pray. God, we do thank you. Um, we thank you to know that we were made in your image. Or we know that we haven't reflected that well. We know, in fact, that because of our sin, we have completely marred your image. Lord, when Jesus saves us, he allows us again to try to, to reflect who you are, to show to a world that many in, case, in many cases are rejecting you, to show to a world who you are. Lord, I pray that you will help us. Uh, two aspects of this, Lord, I pray that you will help us to be people who value uh, man, value others, value your creation the way that you do. And secondly, I pray that you help us to reflect who you are. Show to the world around us your greatness. We ask this in Christ's name.